you know, a lot of the research was done Marin on men just because, you know, their physiology is less undulating than women. So as a researcher, it's easier. There's less dependent variables um, because the physiology is more controllable. And so there's always been this notion of we're going to train everybody as if they're the same. But in the vein of equal, but not the same, there is an advantage to understanding uh, the undulations of feminine uh, physiology during the menstrual years and even perimenopausal and postmenopausal. Hey, what's up? It's time for Man and Lezik podcast. Um, I hope you are well. I hope you had a good week and I hope you are getting stoked on some vitamin D. Uh, it's been pretty nice. Now, uh, this podcast is brought to you by TRX Training Sydney. Uh, got to clear up some beef uh, last week. Uh, got a bit of slack from the female uh, listeners uh, saying that I didn't include them and I just spoke about B. Rad or Brad Pitt from Fight Club. So guess what? Uh, for ladies, if you want to look like a Victoria's Secret model, uh, jump on TRX. So the secret of Victoria's Secret is that uh, they get stoked on TRX Loros. So if you want to get a set of angel wings, you got to crank some TRX uh, Loros, which we do in our TRX circuit classes. Uh, I don't know about this, but the jokes aside, uh, we are launching uh, or we have launched the um, a new kettlebell block. So we're focusing on... Or a lot more ground to standing exercises plus we are working a lot more in the front of plane for the next uh, four weeks so head to trxtrainingsydney.com hit me up with an email and we'll chat and we'll get you uh, to start frothing with kettlebells and trx with rest of the crew now today's guest is amazing uh, michelle decor uh, Michelle is inventor of Viper Pro, plus he also uh, runs uh, Institute of Motion. Institute of Motion is, in my opinion, one of the best educational uh, certificates or mentorships uh, for health coaches. Uh, I did a mentorship many years ago with Michelle and it really changed everything for me. Not only understanding how body works from cellular level, so understanding how to train someone from inside out, but just to be curious about what I do, how I program, and why I program for uh, you know particular populations. So listen to Michelle. Uh, we discuss a lot about training from inside out. We discuss about programming. Uh, we discuss about female training. Um, I think you'll really enjoy this one. Um, Michelle knows how to make something really complex uh, quite simple. Uh, so, yeah, let's get into it. Enjoy it. Michelle, welcome to the pod. How are you going? Hey, buddy. I uh, appreciate you making the time and... Uh it's good to see you. No, thank you. It's good to see you. Good to see you healthy, well. Uh, still got a mess of guns. Um, so, yeah, you're looking good. Yeah, I can't see him right now. <laughs> uh, mate, for my audience, um, can you kind of give us your background and, and, and um, you know, what, what, you, what your story is, really? Uh, well, uh, I think educationally and, and kind of career-wise, um, I was born and raised in Canada. I did my graduate and undergraduate studies at the University of Alberta in Canada. And some 12-ish, 13-ish years ago, I moved down to the States. Uh, I did some academic work at the University of San Francisco for a time. And uh, in my process of, of living down here in the States, in California, uh, I started up two businesses. The first was Viper and now Viper Pro, which is the new version of it, which is a product. And then uh, we've got an IOM business that has basically three arms. It has a fitness arm, it has a, a performance arm, and then it has a health prevention health or health coaching arm, so three arms. And um, they all commingle to a certain degree because our, our point of view uh, on every one of them is if it's fitness related or even performance related, Marin, th the question is, can you be fit and also healthy? Uh, I had the good fortune last year to present the NFL Combine, which is the, the gridiron football 
And it's the combine is where all the college players get tested out to, to kind of an interview to become professionals in the NFL. And so uh, there was a strength and conditioning conference for all 32 NFL teams and, and all their strength coaches. And um, through a gentleman named Bill Parisi, I was able to uh, speak there and um, was very honored to do so. And in talking to all the SNC coaches, Marin, they always said something that was actually very resonant. And I was talking about this yesterday. Uh, they talked about the idea of the, because they said, listen, by the time people get to this level, even the third tiered players are still elite. Like they're all elite. Because to make it to the top echelon of, of gridiron, you've got to be elite. And so our goal is not to make them necessarily bigger, stronger, faster, because guess what? They're all bigger, stronger, faster. Uh, so they said the best ability for our players is availability. And I thought about that, and I thought, man, that's so important as, in every stream of life. The best ability is availability, right? Can you be available to participate? You know, if I'm playing with my daughter, am I available? Right? Am I in the moment with her? Because uh, if not, she'll know. Uh, am I available from a physiological perspective, right? Is my body available to do what it needs to do? And we lose that availability as we get older if we don't take a concerted effort to intervene in some sort of strategy, right? And so that, that saying really stuck with me. And, you know, so what we tend to do in our businesses is look at fitness, performance, and health on the same level. Right. And, and we could talk about the fitness aspect and what's in vogue right now for fitness. But a lot of times it's not necessarily healthy in the long term. Right. If all I do is high intensity exercise every day, right, there is uh, mTOR is good and bad. Right. There's there's inflammation pathways. There's cytokines that are released that over time can be disruptive to my well-being. And so, yeah, I'm fit in the short or medium term, but am I am I sustainable in the medium and long term? And if we can equally index those two things, like I'm fit and I can perform and I can be badass, whatever that means, and I can be healthy, that is something that is meaningful, I think, to a lot of folks. And we usually anchor into the idea of being unbreakable. Right? Can I be unbreakable? Mate, I love that. And um, we first met uh, a long time ago now at um, at uh, Mentorship in Brisbane. We're both 25, We're both 25 so it yeah, can't be that long. Exactly. And uh, one of the things you open up the mentorship with was, you know, be curious. I want you to be curious and that really stuck with me. Um, and then another thing we spoke about in the mentorship was, you know, not just how to design a great programming, was actually what happens inside the body, you know, and what happens to the cell. Um, and obviously, you know, you know, you're trying to make something really complex, quite simple for us as, as it can be to, to kind of make us understand when it comes to the programming, what are we trying to get out of it? And um, what I wanted you to talk about today, I want to discuss with you is, is aging. Because um, I think what you just said was like really resonates with me as well. Like, I want to be healthy. I want to live, you know, till 120 and, and play with my daughter and, and be available to throw her around and go surfing or whatever. But I also want to look good. Like, I want to look yeah. good in my speedos. You know, you know how it is. Uh, you want to be good in red speedos. So you got it. Yeah. So like, um, what I want to talk to you about is 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 aging bit. You know, like, um, you know, why do we age? Yeah. Well, the process of aging, you know, is pretty complex, but it, it, to a certain degree, to, to a large degree, it's predicated on uh, cellular function. So when we look at things, we tend to look at things in the gym on a kind of a, a, a mechanical perspective. What are the nerves doing? Uh, how do they conduct and create an action potential? How does that act on the muscle? What are they doing? And then how can we have uh, an aesthetic outcome or some sort of you know, performance outcome in the short term. I can run a marathon. I look good without clothes on. And it's refreshing to understand as a coach, because if we kind of dabble into the idea of health coaching or just coaching, whatever you want, I want for you too, right? As a good coach, right? So if you came to me and said, or if I came to you rather, and I said, hey, I want to be the best CrossFitter around, and you had an opinion about CrossFit, good or bad, and that's not really the point of this, you may recognize, Michelle, listen, you're, you know, whatever you are, you're in, in your 40s, you know, you're not ready for it. You should have another goal. The the inquiry, the appreciative inquiry of, well, why do you want that? And you through a, a process of discovery, you may discover that I just had a son, which I don't have, but let's say I did. And let's say I was always a chubby kid and I was never athletic. And I, I went and saw on TV these CrossFit games. And I said, have you seen these? And you said, yeah. And I said, you know, listen, I have a, a newborn son and I want to teach my son what it is to be capable. 
because I saw these men and women on these CrossFit games and, you know, they were capable. They could run and jump and they had, a, they had control and autonomy over their body and this vessel called, you know, the human form and it inspired me and I want to do that and I want to show my son what it is to be capable. If you were listening to that as a coach, you would recognize that CrossFit awesome, but what's really important? What's my value set? My son. So you even ask me, what's my son's name? And I would tell you and I said, listen, you know, if you want to do that for your son, I want that for you too, right? And we have a map to try to get you to where you want to go. Even in your mind's eye, you might think, well, you're not ready for that yet. That's secondary as a consideration. The idea of hearing them and saying, we can walk that path of readiness to get to where you want to go as a goal is critically important. And that's the value of coaching. So, you know, whatever a person's goal is, it is. And to a certain degree, we are environmental engineers as health coaches or personal trainers. And as an environmental engineer, I create an environment and then I coach you through that environment and then biology, chemistry ensues. And so the idea of aging is a process by which chemistry, signaling, all that begins to change over time, right? Phenotyping, right? Expression of genotypes, they, they change over time. So we've got this chemistry that begins to kind of morph over time. And there are certain things that we can do lifestyle-wise. There are certain things we can do dietary-wise. There are certain things we can do from a physicality perspective to intervene, right? It's impossible to say we're going to anti-age. We're all going to age. But we can slow down and successfully age, which is a different context. We're never going to reverse the aging process. However, we can intervene to change its rate by which it changes. That's cool. And, and that's really the value of understanding how to program because um, I guess no one really dies from old age anymore, don't they? They, they, they generally pass away from some sort of disease. Um, and I guess they, they'd probably die because they're just not capable of dealing with stresses. Um, and I remember like reading somewhere, like I'm not sure if this is true or not, but like if your cell uh, goes below 70% of its functionality, you're open up to um, all sorts of things. Yeah, it's, it's quite complex and there's many factors, but yes, I mean, think about this. And I want your audience to visualize this, this try, this kind of stream of, of, of kind of cascade of, 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 um, um, of descent. So if we think about the aging process, so here's what happens. A loss of adaptability leads to functional impairment, which leads to death. Yep. And that could be cell death, which is autophagy. Or that could be system death or the organism death, which is I cease to live. So if we, if we dissect that for a second, loss of adaptability leads to functional impairment, which leads to death. So what you said is if a cell, a system loses capacity to a certain degree, and there's a threshold, then that leads to functional impairment, and then there's dysregulation, right? So the things start to break down. So if you're thinking about intervening somewhere in the aging process, I want you to think about the idea of uh, loss of adaptability is where we as coaches, as trainers, that's where we come in. So there are many ways in which we can create more adaptability. That can be metabolic flexibility. That could be better movement at the hips to take away pressure of the knee. That could be a variety of different things that we move. We, we start to increase, let's say, uh, variability of, of forces in the body, that leads to resiliency, right? Because more adaptability means you bend without breaking in the, kinda in the metaphorical sense, yep. right? So we anchor to this notion of, of what we call variability, right? So if I unpack the idea of variability for in a couple ways, I would say I would sell you this car. If I was selling you information today, I'd, I'd strongly sell you the idea of variability. And we'll go on the opposite and argue against it just for a second, uh, just to see if we can unpack it. But variability is going to be key. No, not enough of it is rigidity, which is the enemy of biology, and too much of it is chaos. So we need the right amount of adaptability or, or what we would call variability. But if we go to a typical training scenario, is there a variability? No. I do the same motion, typically sagittal. I do it over and over again. I run, and that's all I do, and I run in a straight line without turning corners, and I get injured. And so what we need to do is understand, or at least the information I want to try to sell, is the notion of understanding the value of adaptability. 
So we would say, what is the best posture? Well, it's the one that changes. I don't care if you're in perfect anatomical neutral. If that's what you hold all day, that is going to be detrimental at a certain point in time. So variability of posture, changing your posture throughout the day, is actually critical for success. And we see that because of the seated posture and all these yeah. other things. It's held too long. And the antidote to that is not holding great posture for too long. It's changing your posture throughout the day, all day, intermittently. Right? Uh, there's a lot of strong evidence to say that seasonal eating increases gut flora. Right. So variability of eating. Right. So in the beginning of, you know, let's say fruit season, these fruits are yielding. So we used to eat a lot of those and then we transfer all along the way. And that increases gut flora. Well, gut flora uh, is a precursor to the breakdown of nu nutrients and um, and has a lot of impact on the rest of the body uh, from an uh, from an immune perspective and, uh, and a health perspective. Uh, the next one is mechanical variability, right? Farm kid wrestles with gym kid. Where's your money? On the farm kid. Yeah, totally. Who had more vector variability? Who had more movement and load variability? The farmer. Okay. Uh, how about metabolic variability, which is called metabolic flexibility? Use a variety of different substrates as fuel makes you physiologically ready. Same thing with gaze variability, right? We stare at a screen too long and there's a degeneration of the eyes, myopia. You look at the research on myopia, it says two things. Get outside and change your depth of field. Well, get outside means brightness in your eyes, right? And I don't mean staring at the sun. I mean get brightness in your eyes because that's vasoconstriction. And vasoconstriction is good for the small muscles of the eye and also for its impact on the autonomic nervous system. So we've got all of these things, Marin, that suggest that a certain dose of variability is actually very useful and very healthy for the body. And what we've done in our modern world is we've created rigidity, the same thing over and over again. And so I guess what I'm here to sell is the notion that if we want to bend without breaking, if we want to truly be fit and healthy, if we want to slow the aging process down so that we can successfully age and look good and feel good along the way, then we need to understand that loss of adaptability is where we intervene. We want to increase adaptability. And to do that, we have to introduce a certain amount of dosage of variability cool no that's that's i mean that makes perfect sense and also it's, it makes it fun as well it makes it more enjoyable to uh be healthy as well if you keep changing it up rather than doing the you know the same thing over and over and over um so on that yeah. michelle like what, what okay let's what's um what is a good um anti-aging or successful aging program look like where should we start yeah, that's a good question. Uh, that's a pretty broad question, but it's a really good question, Merritt. So the way we might approach it is this. So we have to look at lifestyle factors. We can look at, you know, stress factors. And exercise itself is a stressor, right? So if I'm exercising at a certain intensity, and, and the flavor of the day in fitness is, is high intensity. Yeah. But if I'm introducing high intensity to an already stressed out system, I'm increasing inflammatory markers. I'm increasing cytokine or, you know, activity, which is um, a signaling molecule that affects immunity and growth factors. And what happens is I could have a short-term immunosuppressed environment, right? I'm getting cold, I'm getting sniffles. In COVID right now, that's a real concern for a lot of folks, right? How can I exercise so that I can increase my chi or my, you know, vitality without the detrimental breakdown of it? So the way we might start off is, is there a balance between, you know, stress and recovery? Seems pretty simple. Uh, that's no, you know, great revelation for anybody. But the decision tree that we might go through, Marin, is this. If it's a, so our first decision tree is, is today a workout day or is today a work in day? That's your first decision. And by workout, we mean, is it mechanical? Is it metabolic or is it both? Meaning, is it, you know, your strength day, your weights day? Is it a cardio day or is it a combination of both? A combination of both would be your boot camps and your, your CrossFit. You know, a lot of weights, a lot of, you know, what you're moving. And then there's a high yield of metabolic demand. So that'd be a combination of both. So those are your choices if it's a workout day. If it's a work-in day, is it in the gym, right, on the gym floor? Is it outside the gym or is it a complete day off? Well, let me give you an example. If it's a work-in day in the gym, you would go to the gym or I would go to the gym and I would maybe work in for 45 minutes an hour. And I would do joint strengthening exercise, which is type one recruitment. I might do neural stretches. I might do neural flossing. I might do some Aldoa techniques, FRC. There's like 
a lot of great techniques out there to increase the capacity of my body to move. I would leave the gym, and I've done this you know, more times than I can count. I leave the gym not really sweating, but I leave the gym, Marin, feeling bulletproof mm. and unbreakable. Why? Because I invested 45 minutes or an hour on joint care, right? Foam rolling, distraction techniques, voodoo flossing, compression wraps. All of these techniques are out there. And if, if all those sound new to you, don't worry about that. There are techniques that are out there. And I can give you some information on where to get these techniques later on. But, but in saying that, there are ways in which we can triage and then engineer recovery days. And that's an in-the-gym recovery day. It looks nothing like a workout. But it has everything to do with bulletproofing or un- uh, building a body that is unbreakable. Mm. And that is empowering. Right, because you leave the gym feeling unbe- unbelievable, feeling like man, my joints feel great, uh, my system feels ready. Uh, and we do breathing exercises, we do eye tracking exercises, everything that is strange. But we would say that things are weird until they're not. Yeah. Right, and that's our big saying: things are weird until they're not. Right, you look at eye tracking. I can do that in the gym, and everybody's giving me a lot of space because I'm a weirdo. And then they go home and they watch a, you know, international rugby game and they watch the Haka and, you know, the New Zealanders are, you know, tapping their body, which is stimulation. Their eyes are bugging out. And that's not weird. That's cool. So yeah. same thing, but different perspective, right? Uh, but we do that. And uh, these things are being more, uh, in, they're being more accessible to the end, you know, the end consumer because of individuals that are out there pushing the boundaries and trying to understand the physiology. What and a, so yeah, that's yeah. kind of the, the in the gym working working day. The outside the gym real quick. The outside the gym working day would be, you know, hot and cold contrast thermogenesis. So hot and cold bath, bineural beat, Normatec boots, whatever it is that you can do throughout your day to increase the parasympathetic dominance. And so we engineer all of these protocols in an, a library and, you know, fitness trainers or the fitness enthusiasts can then pull that in and say, okay, I'm going to actually engineer my workout days and my work in days to be highly effective. One of the things I, um, I do with a lot of my clients now, we use a VoIP band and we measure HIV. And a lot of that stuff is kind of, we, we, I determine what sort of workout um, um, we'll do depending on what your recovery score is. Um, but like if you don't have access to HIV or I don't know, like how would you know where you're at? Like is there another way to kind of figure out it comes down to perception, right? So there are perceived uh, indexes, right? So there's a perceived exertion. Um, there might be just a, you know, a, a mindful reflection. Because what it comes down to is, what, how am I feeling truly? And that comes down to, you know, either meditation or mindful reflection. Because you can take your heart rate, um, and but there's no real, you can't really test your blood sugar levels without having that test done. You can't really think about it. Uh, you can't really think about your heart rate and, and how that's being affected. So what it comes down to is a reflection on how I'm feeling. And that comes down to malaise, right? I don't feel like working out today. Uh, that comes down to taking a, a good, conscious, mindful, realistic, and honest account of your stress. So what we might do is, you know, what's going on in your life, right? Write down all your stresses. It could be physical. And then what are your relationships like right now? How's your sleep? Right? Those things can be actually to a certain degree documented, and you can use those as a surrogate uh, to the wearables that are out there, which are great. But if I'm saying, man, my sleep is disrupted, I keep waking up during the night, I can't get to sleep, I wake up and, and my sleep quality without even a tracker, I know it's kind of poor, I'm tired, then you know we can take into account, well, what is there stress out there? And what it, what is it, right? And health coaches would lead a process by which uh, they invite those thoughts into their consciousness, and then we start to address, or, or the participant starts to self-determine, and they address the elements that they need to address within the capacities that they have, encouraged by a health coach. Uh, and so that that is a way uh, to take into account if I am over chronically overreaching or stressed out and need recovery. If you have someone, someone's listening here and they're just, super stressed now um super stressed because of corona you know the job that they, they, they weren't really eating healthy before this they're, they're struggling like i mean if you're going to get a blood test to see what's going inside what are some of the biomarkers you might be looking at 
um, there could be like a red flag straight off the bat, like uh, on cellular level again. Is there anything you particularly you should be checking for yeah, first? Beyond, yeah, beyond, beyond triglycerides and cholesterol and everything else, you could look at, you know, uh, resting glucose. Because if yep. it's high, there's, there's more sugars in the blood, then, you know, typically it's a restful state. But you would need that over time because you could go to the doctor and just having done a run and, you know, that could be off. Um, but another one is uh, the C-reactive protein, which is a, a marker for systemic inflammation. So if you're seeing that CRP value uh, at a certain level, it might be indicative of chronic inflammation, right? And so, you know, these types of things will reveal themselves um, in, in a blood test, and they could be revealing for an individual. Now, if they're stressed out and, you know, they're, they're worried about their job right now because of COVID, they're worried about their health. They're worried about getting into the public because of COVID. And then they're worried about, man, there's so much information out there. I just really don't know where to start. Uh, I think the first thing we can do as, as health and fitness professionals is really empathize with that. There's a lot of noise. That would be like you and I, if we're not primarily trained in, I don't know, international accounting. And we're trying to navigate the laws and the complexities of accounting and business and business transactions internationally. You know, what we wouldn't necessarily do is get on a podcast and try to learn it. We would probably hire an accountant and one that specializes in that area. And I think that there's so much information out there now, and it, it's so difficult to, to kind of land on what may be important, that for a number of individuals, they can lean on health coaches. They can lean on personal trainers as a way to, um, as a way to, to soften some of the hard corners of what do I do. And a lot of times what you do is not everything, right? You do one thing and you concentrate on one thing, you make a change within your capacity and then you wash, rinse, repeat. And the process of coaching is that, is can we walk into a situation where, you know, th there are small changes over time that lead to autonomous, impactful, masterful uh, health, health and lifestyle changes. Mate, um, one of the things, and I, I want to say thank you first. What you, 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 your mentorship in Institute of Motion has really influenced the way I program these days. Um, and one of the things that you did, um, kind of in, for, for my head, for my, my, you made something really complex, quite simple. And um, at Institute of Motion, you talk about four quadrants, and you use a four quadrant principle, not just for that mechanical. Uh, training program where you use it as a, as conditioning as well and and I've seen like you started kind of playing with it even nutritionally like using the quadrants as well so for my audience can you kind of I know it's uh we only got a few minutes left but can you talk yeah. about four quadrants for us can you uh, explain it sure yeah so four Q stands for four, four quadrants so typically if you think about you know uh, either a cross or a plus sign right and what you have is you've got two continuums You've got an X axis that goes left and right, and you've got a Y axis that goes up and down. Now, before I jump into the quadrants, uh, we're big believers in continuum-based thinking. Very rarely in biology is it black or white, or in one end or the other. There's never really a binary choice. It, there is typically a, an undulation because of what's called systems biology. And so it's very hard for us to say, okay, this is good, this is bad. There may be shades of good and shades of bad that are higher, but we're big on continuum-based thinking, right? What is the continuum? And where do we sit along this continuum? And if we shift it along the continuum, is that helpful? And this goes to our, our saying, better beats perfect, right? Better beats perfect every time. So is the idea to get to the one end of the continuum or to shift a little bit, right? And we would say every time from a habit formation, from a coaching perspective, better beats perfect every time. And so with that thinking, what we've done is we've created these, these, these four quadrant models. We've got one for stress, mechanical stress. We'll call it, you know, strength training or kind of gym workouts. We've got one for a 4Q metabolic, and we've got one for recovery. And so what we do is we take into account these continuums, and we, we map them together. So let me walk you through the neuromechanical one, which is a complex way of saying, how do we load the body and how do we move the body? So think about the gym workouts, right? And so if you think about the y-axis going up and down, at the top of that axis, we have a loaded. And by loaded, we mean, is there any type of external resistance being influenced on the body? A barbell, a dumbbell, a kettlebell, you know, a, a, um, a band, a viper, um, you know, a cable system, 
anything that's a weight vest, a prowler, anything that's going to load the body is we say it's loaded. So it's on top of that X axis. On the bottom is what we call unloaded, which is your body weight. So you can go for a swim or a surf. Uh, you can go for a run. It could be push-ups or pull-ups. It's your body weight. If you're into uh, the body weight athlete, right, gymnastics and tumbling, that's all body weight driven. We would call that unloaded, and it's on the bottom of that continuum. So there's the x-axis. Excuse me, the y-axis. The x-axis going left to right. On the left-hand side is linear patterns, and that's just typically forward and back, up and down. And then on the opposite end of that spectrum on the x-axis is what we call multiplanar. And that is more, you know, three-dimensional movement. And so each one of these quadrants has an impact on what we do. And it's not that one is good and one is bad. They all have benefits. And I won't get into all of the complexities of the benefit right now. But as an example, if I took those two continuums and I, I bifurcated them, I, I put them, I split them, what that would do is you've got the y-axis here and the x-axis here. That would create four quadrants. So if I've got loaded on top and unloaded on the bottom, and I've got linear and multiplanar, left and right, I've now got in the top left in your mind's eye, I've got loaded linear training. It's on the top and on the left, loaded linear training. On the bottom left, I've got unloaded or body weight linear training. On the bottom right, it's unloaded multiplanar training. And on the top right, it's loaded multiplanar training. Now the value of this is is pretty extraordinary for the body. So in his example, a bench press would be loaded linear for the chest, let's say. A push-up would be unloaded linear, and that's for the chest. A crawling or Spider-Man push-up would be the bottom right quadrant, unloaded multiplanar. It's still a chest exercise. And a standing single arm cable push with rotation is loaded multiplanar. It would be in the top right. So there is a chest exercise in each one of the quadrants but they offer a unique advantage, all of them. And so the idea is we have to understand what a bench press does to the body, what a push-up does to the body, what a traveling push-up, and what a single arm cable rotation is. And it doesn't necessarily mean we do them all. But what we have to do to be more resilient and more unbreakable and more variable and adaptable is we need to consider all of them. Which ones do I want to do today? Because if all I do is one, I'm not – introducing the uh, enough variability to be healthy and so we use these quadrant schemes metabolic neuromechanical and recovery we call them four cues we use these schemes as a way to guide us through the process of choice so that we can equally index towards performance and also health and if we can do those things you said it before mary i want to age i want to look good right i want to look good in my speedos you said and I want to also function good. And you know what? No judgment. If you want to look good naked, awesome. Good for you, right? There is no – if you want aesthetic goals, awesome. No vanity there. That's awesome. That's what you want. And if you also want to age better and, and function better so you can surf and play with your, your daughter, and that's awesome, right? And so there is absolutely no judgment there. If that's your value set, then I value that for you too as a coach. And so what we, what we do is we use these – as a guiding mechanism to create the right choices for an individual to get where they want to go sustainably. Uh, that's, I mean, and I think that's what sometimes in, in current fitness, traditional fitness, people feel like they can't have both, you know, like uh, they think, okay. oh, if I want to be healthy, I'll do wellness and it's just yoga. Or, you know, if I want to be shredded, I've got to do CrossFit and that's it. Where you can actually, if you know the rules, and that's why I wanted to get you on, talk about what goes on inside first, know the rules, then we can break the rules or we can tweak the rules to get there. Um, can you sp speak about recovery? Because recovery is something, or recovery programming is something also the Institute of Motion has really put in my head. And it's one of the things you challenged me personally. You probably don't remember it, but it's like, you said to me, like, any coach can write a program to get you tired or, you know, to get me 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 a mechanical stress on your body. But how many coaches can actually write a recovery program so you recover better and, you know, get the benefits of all the stresses that you put on your body? So how does a quadrant and recovery work? Uh, so good question. So we want to engineer stress and recovery, and we want to do them both. Now, you know, 15 years ago, it was like, just take the day off, and that's your recovery day, which is fine. That's one of our choices is the day off. But we can also do in the gym and, you know, outside the gym-based recovery. And we know through – if you if, – 
if your audience is any degree of fitness enthusiast, they're going to kind of get on some blogs and they're going to get on some, some, you know, some information highways that, that reveal biohacks, right? You can do this with ice. You can do this with breathing. And all those are great, but how do we actually take all of those and consolidate that into a session? Because at a certain point, they're just sound bites. But how do we aggregate that all and say, okay, here's what your choices are. So in our 4Q recovery, think of the same thing. You got a Y axis and an X axis. The Y axis is now global on top and local on the bottom. And that means systemic, right, outcomes of recovery. And this means local, which means a region of the body recovery. On the x-axis, on the left, you have uh, passive, and on the right, you have active. And by passive, we mean there's no real mental or physical effort needed to get the result done. And then if we look at active, there is some sort of you know thing that I need to think about or do in order to initiate a recovery pro process. So if I'm doing different breathing patterns, right, they would either, depending on what I do, they would either be local, active or global active. So I'll say that again for clarity. They need to be either local active or global active because the the um, the effort of breathing <laughs> is actually very important and it's active. So I can just breathe and that's, a you know, for this area of the body. But if I'm doing certain holds, like I'm doing a type one uh, pre-position, which is I'm laterally flexing and rotating my spine in opposite directions, and then I'm doing some sort of passive breathing, that would be more of a global active response because I'm holding my body position, my foot, my knee, my hip, and my thoracic spine in a certain position. And I'm requiring myself to breathe and relax into that position. And by virtue of doing that recovery exercise, I can actually br take breathing and what we might call percussive breathing or forced breathing uh, and use that as a mechanism to create stability. And once there's stability, the nervous system reduces the amount of threat because now there's safety. And typically what we do is we re reduce the stress response in the body. Uh, and then, you, you know, by virtue of breathing, if you're using the diaphragm, you stimulate the vagus nerve, which is all about rest and digest or, or parasympathetic dominance. It's got parasympathetic fibers that come off of it, which, which is the tense cranial nerve, and go right into your gut and increase stem cell activity for gut repair. There's a lot of physiological effects that come out of breathing uh, in, done in a certain way. But again, going back to our loss of adaptability, we don't think just relaxed breathing is what we train. We also want to breathe sympathetically. Mm. So we might hold certain positions and blow out or inhale all of our air in rapid succession, which is percussive, or in slow, full, deep exhalation or slow, deep inhalation within the capacity of our lungs. And that will increase, you know, all sorts of different factors from muscle recruitment to lung function. And that increases our capacity to live, right? So we do that as a, a workout strategy and we do that as a work-in strategy, depending on the techniques that we go for. So what we have is in these techniques, we've got uh, global and we've got local, we've got passive and we've got active in the four cues. So when we start to bifurcate those and we start to have those quadrants, what we end up with is uh, a library of exercises in each of the quadrants that give us protocols, not activities or not exercises, but protocols, in order for us to engineer a recovery session. Oh, that's cool. I'm, I'm actually frothing right now, so I'm, I'm pretty excited about this because it just makes so much sense. You know, it's uh, yeah, and and and, uh, and there's a lot of there. yeah, and I think. What I want to get people, you know, be curious is like, hey, you know, you'd be doing, before Corona, you'd be doing this five times a week, you got a lack of sleep, you rock up to this session, you don't do any mobility, any breath work, you just kind of hammer yourself and you're doing the same thing over and over and over again. And you kind of maybe not getting results, like maybe start, start, it's time to reset and think about, hey, let's think about a whole body and let's think about being healthier. But not only that, you can still look amazing, like you can still feel amazing, look good and all the rest of it. Um, Michelle, I don't want to keep you too long, um, but for people listening to this and they're like, oh, wow, there's actually a bit more than, um, you know, high intensity stuff. Where can they kind of find you or your Institute of Motion? Like where, where can people find out more information um, about yeah. IOM? Uh, well, 
if they go onto social media, if you go on Instagram or Facebook, Institute of Motion, yep, uh, or Viper Pro, so V I P R Pro, yep, uh, or Institute of Motion, uh, you'll find some more. I'm going to say some more practical elements because social media is great for just here's an exercise or here's a protocol, yep. and so it's a perfect vehicle for that. So you can find more information there. If you go to our website, instituteofmotion.com. You can find more information, or if you go to platform by IOM on the app store or the Android store, you can find our app. And in there, there is a lot of information. If you're a fitness professional and you want, you know, kind of the deeper dive, then you can find those, um, you know, those resources out there. If you're a fitness enthusiast and you want more strategy, you want more exercise examples and so forth. Uh, you know, I would say social media as, as an easy reach would give you a good entry point to our philosophies and what we hold to be near and dear. And so, you know, we look at a lot of complexity and, um, and we also look at genders. You know, a lot of the research was done, Marin, on men, just because, you know, their physiology is less undulating than women. So as a researcher, it's easier. There's less dependent variables um, because the physiology is more controllable. And so there's always been this notion of we're going to train everybody as if they're the same. But in the vein of equal, but not the same, there is an advantage to understanding uh, the undulations of feminine uh, physiology during the menstrual years and even perimenopausal and postmenopausal. And so that's something that, you know, our team is looking into. And also the transgender community, yeah. right? A very marginalized community and very underserviced because if you looked at it and you said, I'm transitioning from male to female, do you train me as a male or a female? Yeah. Right. And the industry is like, I don't know, I think maybe if you're transitioning towards male, I train you as a male. And there's a lot of research still to be done on this. And in our early looks and in the early research that's being done, there seems to be a sense that uh, gen genotyping and phenotyping still has a major impact. Right. So we train them in specific ways relative to uh, a transition of gender. And we train females during their menstrual years specific to the four phases of menstrual cycle. And I've got a nine-year-old daughter and it, it's near and near to my heart because she and I have many conversations about this and I'm very comfortable and I'm very, you know, clinical, I guess, in, in relaying information to her, but I'm not leaning back and I'm not avoiding those conversations. And what she's taught me through that process is the more honest and the more comfortable dad is, the more comfortable she is. Totally. And there is a sex advantage to knowing when androgens and knowing when estrogens are going to peak during your four phases of the menstrual cycle. Because you can recover awesome when your estrogens are high, and you can train beast mode when your androgens are high. And that is an advantage. Totally. Right? And so there is a, a kind of a mind flip to uh, this is, you know, something that I've got to work. These are constraints that I got to work in. No, the, the real reality is these are, these are actually benefits and these are advantages to knowing when. And there's a reason why, on average, men have more heart attacks than women because estrogens are anti-inflammatory. Yes. So right. you can control inflammation if you over-index on them during certain phases, right, menstrual and, and the luteal phase. That's a great time for people to, you know, lean into the work in days. Not to the exclusion of some workouts, but you undulate it differently, right? And so there's a real difference between that. And I think that it's high time that our industry knows a little bit more about who we're dealing with and the advantages of that physiology. It's so funny you say that because yesterday I got a WhatsApp group from all my kind of people I train and we were, I put a thing about circadian rhythms. And most of my, 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 my people in my group are females. And the question was, well, is it the same for a female? So I gave a smart ass answer that, you know, I, I'm not going to repeat, I'll get in trouble. But you know, it is so true and like, it, and it's funny you saying it because it's like most of my clients are female, yet a lot of the research that we follow is for tested on males. So thanks for that. Thanks for sharing that. I'm going to fully check it out and well, get some estrogen to inject as well. So, yeah. um, Well, yeah. Marin, that's an honest answer you're giving me because yeah. if we're honest with ourselves, the industry has done a disservice to uh, other genders. Like the transgender is, you know, under under represented uh, representative uh, represented rather and and so is the female population within training and so you know there's a lot of good information that's out there and uh, we've got uh, two PhDs on our staff that uh, that are working towards you know more uh, involvement 
and and one of our PhD is writing her thesis on that very thing. And so, you know, we're pretty fortunate to um, to have their voices at the table. And you know, we all we want to do is we want to engage in a substantive conversation that's respectful and meaningful, so that we can do a better job of creating the right environment for the folks that we serve. Now, this is amazing. Um, lastly, um, if people are listening to this and they want to get a IOM qualified coach, is there a, um, a health coach? Is there a directory for health coaches that you got? Is there, where can I find? A, uh, there, there is. So we, in, in Aussie, that's, that's not quite there yet, but in Singapore, we're doing a lot. And then North America, we're doing a lot. But, you know, over the, the coming months, we are actually doing a lot more health coaching. And we've, yeah. we've aligned with certain individuals in the space, well coaches, uh, med pro, uh, even our partners within Singapore, and we're creating a framework on how to train and, and upskill health coaches, yep. uh, how to board certify them through our partners at, at a company called Well Coaches, wonderful folks. Uh, they're affiliated with Harvard University as well. And uh, by educating these individuals on how to become health coaches, and if they're board certified, they will navigate within you know their scope of practice. Uh, they are educated on, you know, how to create the coaching experience so it's safe and meaningful for folks. And it's all within a structure that is governed by uh, certain watchdogs that uh, that make sure that there's a standardization of care that's important. Yeah. So we're pretty thrilled to be involved with those individuals. And through the coming months that, that lay out in front of us, uh, we're going to get more and more um, opportunities to be able to come in and, you know, kind of lay out that landscape for folks. So I think, you know, let's, you and I stay connected and, um, and that will increase. And it's not, you know, in two years from now, we're talking about months away because we have initiated this, uh, particularly with our partners in Singapore. Now, I know in Australia, um, there'd be probably more need for health coaches and something that Corona's definitely, uh, you know, thought everyone is like, hey, it's cool to look cool. It's good to like, you know, look good in a um, bikini and stuff. But what really matters is having a strong immunity system, you know, not having diabetes, high blood pressure and, you know, what's on inside. And, and I heard a quote like, you know, when Corona first came out, everyone was saying, don't touch your face and wash your hands. It was about hygiene on the outside. But what about a hygiene on an inside that no one really spoke about? And I guess my, one of my concerns, and I'll let you go soon, is like if a vaccine does come out, are you ready to take it on? Are you ready to inject something in your body? Is your system capable of dealing with it to create those antibodies as well? And I think it's probably not a good time if people start getting healthier for it when it does come out. I think there's a real honest and uh, there's a real uh, strong mindfulness around the idea of being resilient. And, you know, people are, folks are nervous and they should be. Um, And, you know, so, if I can take, take care of myself and if I can take care of my health to the certain degree, that is a gift to me, but it's a gift to those around me as well. Mm. And that sounds overly kumbaya, but you know, I think what we have to recognize is there's a lot of noise out there and people need guidance and help. They want guidance and help, just like we would if we're going through you know, legal affairs, right? Yeah. We want to hire a lawyer. That, that professional can walk us through this. And I think there's the value of a personal trainer or a health coach, right? If they're that strong voice. Uh, and that strong care and that human to human connection and that empathetic voice to be able to kind of take an individual and, and get them to where they want to go. I think there's meaning in that. Mm, right. And, and a good health coach has empathy and authority. Empathy meaning I, I hear you. I, I understand what your value set is and I acknowledge it. And I see who you are and, and I recognize you. And then the authority piece is I have a way to help you. I've got a, you know, a plan for you and, a, and we will walk this path together. And so the effectiveness of that communication, the effectiveness of just being present, being available to that, I think is going to be meaningful for a lot of folks. Because I think what softens some of the fear that's out there is a strong but gentle voice to say, I hear you and I, I'm here to help. Okay. And if that's heartfelt, then and if people feel heard, then, you know, a, a lot can change. Uh, in terms of the ability for them to want to pivot or navigate or change or be ready to change. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I know you have to get on call with the Singapore government. Uh, say hello to the boys from me. Uh, <laughs> but, mate, thank you very much. I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions. Uh, I'm sure people will be, audience will be curious, coaches and, you know, just the general punters. But thank you. We'll be in touch. And, um, yeah, good luck.
Yeah, Marin, I appreciate you, buddy, and uh, thanks for reaching out and, and continued success to you, and, and we're here to help. So you let us know what, what, uh, what you need, and uh, we appreciate your voice in this space. Thanks, mate. Thank you.